My name is Orlando Withers. I am the director of ops over at Applied Diagnostics Laboratory out there in Katy. I know some of you, all of you, 99.9% .9 of you toured the lab. Uh, I do remember the familiar faces. Uh, thank you for coming out, um, you know, and going through uh, this. I want to thank uh, Yolanda and David and Luke from ASI, obviously, for uh, giving us the opportunity to present to you guys. Uh, I, I know that sometimes it's nerve wracking. You've picked this profession and you don't know where it leads. Um, Jamie, myself, Dr. Nordberg, a living proof of where it leads. So is uh, Dr. Gu. Uh, I've been doing this now for almost 19 years. I know I don't look that old, but I am. Um, the fix keeps you young. So, you know, you trust me, you've picked the right profession, okay? All right, he picked the right profession. I've known Dr. Gu now for, for 18 plus years. Uh, so uh, he, he's been really, really great, uh, been a great friend. Um, and I just want to tell him he knows that I'm long-winded. Give me a wave, uh, you know, of right at, uh, I guess, 1030 or else I'm gonna keep on talking. I know lunch is at, uh, what, what, what time is lunch? 11, 11, see, see, I already knew, 1115, good. So. I'm gonna make sure I don't talk too long. So Applied Diagnostics is a full service hematopathology lab. Uh, as Luke said, we do have cytogenetics, fish, molecular, flow cytometry. Is that about it? I think that's about it. Uh, and what I was just telling some of the folks is, is that we have a cytogeneticist in every department. Uh, now, I don't know who all are all, is everyone cytogeneticist? Raise your hands. Or, or, am I? at home? Great. I believe cytogeneticists are the sm smartest people that walk the face of the earth, actually, okay? I'm just telling you right now. Uh, like I said before, we have a cytogeneticist actually in every department. Uh, it's our general curiosity and our willingness to dig down into everything, and we want to know why to every single question on earth. And uh, that's a beautiful thing. Uh, David Rourke is actually my mentor in cytogenetics. Uh, I was the why guy uh, in 2000. I would ask everybody, why would we do this? Why do you add Colsimid? And people would say, because we've always done it this way, just because. And I would ask, well, what's EB4? It's just to add Orlando, shut up and just add it. That's it. And so I was a terrible tech. I was probably one of the worst techs in the facility. I probably was the worst. I felt like my stuff was not good. You use words like pretty, and, and it got you excited. That is what cytogenetics is. Cytogenetics is not science. It's an art. You know, when you use words like pretty, that's something aesthetically pleasing. So that means that cytogenetics is in science. It's art, and that's what we are. We're artists, and we're interpreting. All right? All right. So that is what cytogenetics is, and I was a terrible tech until this man, David Work, walked into the building, and I would ask, I said, David, why do we do this? Because at first people would say, oh, Cosimid makes, makes the Mets. That's what I was told, Cosimid makes the Mets. So I said, okay, if Cosimid makes Mets, if, if I add a little bit more, it'll make even more Mets. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> so you can see I was a terrible tech, okay? So David came and he said, yes, it, it, it does, you know, stop, arrest, the, uh, the, arrest it in phase, destroys the spindles, but if it stays in there too long or if the concentration is too high, it also makes them really, really short and really, really nasty, Orlando. So I stuck to David like glue because every single time I asked a why question, he would answer my question, and I became the best tech, and I became a director of operations. So in life, you're going to learn by two ways, by your mentors or by your mistakes. Inside of genetics, we don't want to learn by our mistakes. Our mistakes could cost somebody their life, all right? All right, so, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I told Luke, man, I might, that might be the only standing ovation I get today. All right, so today we're gonna to go through the why, the what, and the who of cytogenetics. Now, don't be like my wife and correct me and say, Orlando, it's the who, the what, the why. All right, I, I told her there's a reason why it's back, like, backwards. The three Ds, getting to know you, localization, sensitivity, specificity, and reference ranges. You know, I, 
My wife also told me not to tell any of my corny science jokes, but she's not here. <laughs> so no matter what, if you guys laugh or not, I'm gonna tell her that the room erupted in laughter, okay? All right, so can anybody tell me why the bear dissolved in water? Because he was polar. Who said it, who said it? Awesome. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> great, 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 great. So that was amazing. Um, I'm going to tell her it went off very, very well and it went off without a hitch, all right? I'm going to tell her that you guys laughed just hysterically, all right? A Neutron walked into a bar and he ordered a drink and he, said the bar he asked the bartender, how much is it? He said, for you? <laughs> awesome, bro. Awesome. Awesome. Best presentation ever. <laughs> so we want to go through the why, the what, and the who of fish validation. So the reason why we start with it backwards, and it's a little trick also, when you say things incorrectly, uh, like uh, Poe body's nerfect, nobody's perfect, it tends to stick in your head, okay? So that's why I'm saying it backwards, the why, the what, the who. But that's exactly where you start your fish validation process. Now, as I also told somebody in the room, if you know how to do fish validation, then you know how to run a project, a any major corporation. It's the same thought process, and that's how you will move up, okay? The reason why I am where I am right now, also because of David, is because he taught me how to troubleshoot. After a while, I could pick up a slide, look at that slide underneath the microscope, and tell you exactly what you did incorrectly or correctly. I can tell you if you cheated your KCL time, if you cheated your hypo time, ooh, um, same thing, if you cheated your hypo time, uh, if you didn't leave it in COSMID long enough, if you left it in COSMID long, too long, or e EB. So that became a skill and a gift. Troubleshooting is your way to the top, all right? That sets you apart from everyone else. So if you know how to do validations, if you know how to run projects, you can start to write your ticket into anything else that you, where you want to go. I'm sure Jamie can understand that since she's the uh, quality assurance manager also at CorePath, right? Yeah, I can look at any slide and tell you, did you over trypsin too much stain? Whatever's going on. Smartest I do it every day. people on the planet, <laughs> all right? So why is the test being validated? Uh, what is the technique that, uh, that we're using and who is performing it? So what you want to do is, is when you're actually starting your, your validation process, why is the test being validated? You want to write a brief description of what this test is. Uh, if, it's, if it's AML, if it's CML, if it's MDS, whatever you're validating, uh, you want to then discuss what you're, what you're validating. You want to do some background research on it. Tell us why you're bringing this test on. So again, you're the project manager of this test, right? So what, what genes are affected? Uh, for bonus points, you mentioned it earlier, Jamie, what drugs are associated with this actual disease state? Um, so if you're talking about CML, uh, there are certain drugs that is used for treatment. She mentioned it earlier, if you guys remember, if you do or don't, there'll be a test afterwards. So for CML uh, specifically, so chronic myeloid leukemia, Philadelphia chromosome, uh, this positive uh, chronic myeloid leukemia is a type of cancer affecting the blood and bone marrow. Now, I'm going to break everything down in the simplest form, time, for, for time reasons. And also, look, you can generally look this stuff up. If you go to CAP, if you go to a New York State inspection, it will list out the steps in detail of what a fish validation is. So for time, I'm condensing it. Don't think that you could just turn in this short, brief description and you're okay, all right? <laughs> but for time's sake, this is the short, the quick version of it, all right? So individuals with CML produce too many white blood cells, and those abnormal white blood cells crowd out the normal cells. Uh, CML is caused when genetic material from chromosome 9, able gene, switches position with the genetic material from the chromosome 22, BCR, thus forming a translocation. So right there, I gave a brief description of what's going on with the test. I, I named out the disease state, I named out the, cr the chromosomes affected, the genes affected, and then also, what type of test is this? Uh, 
so you can diagnose CML with fish, but also you could do it with what other test? You do it with conventional cytogenetics, but you can also do it with molecular. So typically once a patient is diagnosed, they track the disease or the progression of the disease with molecular. So that is why places like CorePath, like Neogenomics, LabCorp, and, well, let me back up on LabCorp, I'll get back to that in a second, and Applied Diagnostics. Uh, you stole my line earlier, dang it. One-stop shopping, that's exactly what I always used to say about Applied Diagnostics. I started off in LabCorp, and we were segmented and segregated all over the United States. We had our headquarters in North Carolina, our cytogenetics was done here in Houston, where I was, on the Texas Women's Campus, our molecular was done on Gessner. So what happens is, is that, no one communicates, and that delays turnaround time, and it delays getting that, a proper answer. So if your molecular is being done on Gessner and your fish methylation is being done uh, in North Carolina and your conventional cytogenetics is being done in Houston, unless somebody's on the phone or communicating via email, then it's being, your turnaround time is being delayed, treatment is being delayed, and especially when you're dealing with APL, uh, that is vital. So we also do the fast hybe, uh, at Applied Diagnostics, so if a, a patient comes in in the morning, eight in the morning, they're gonna have their results uh, no later than three. Uh, we're, we're gonna make sure flow fish is, is done, ready, and that diagnosis is back out the door because it is very important. Uh, one of my favorite actors, the actor from Spartacus, he died from that. So, it's a fast moving progressive cancer, so turnaround time is vital. So we're always looking for new ways to be efficient Notice that I said the word efficient. I don't want you, and some of you have toured my lab, I always tell you this, I don't ever want you to go fast. I don't want you to go fast, I want you to be efficient. So we're always looking for ways to be more efficient. And that is where ASI comes in. The automated scanner saves us a lot of time looking around, scanning for, um, scanning empty spaces. What it does is it goes through and it takes a picture of every single cell that it sees. Uh, I love ASI, they're my favorite vendor, not just because my mentor works there. Uh, but ASI, one of the things that they always say is that they were, it was designed by cytogeneticists for cytogeneticists. David actually, they stole my mentor. So you notice he works for ASI now, right? So what happened is the first time ASI came through, and Luke is going to be upset with me, they came through before Luke worked there, well before you worked there, and we laughed them out the door because it, didn't, it wasn't intuitive enough for us. It didn't do everything that we wanted it to do. So David stood up next to the guy and said, it needs to do this and it needs to do that. Three weeks later, they came and snatched David up. He goes away, he comes back, and he starts working with me. Orlando, do you like this? Do you like that? Like, yeah, I like these hotspots. I wish it would do this. If I double clicked, I wish it would flip the chromosome. I wish it was a way to suppress the dots when you stop counting and no problem. David went away and basically customized it for me. That's what I'm gonna say, you know. <laughs> but it was, it was awesome. So what sets ASI apart is that it's intuitive technology. It is very user friendly and it was made for us. Now, I've got three platforms in my lab because it was purchased before I got there. So the Metasystems, ASI, and a BioView. So the Metasystems was there for conventional cytogenetics. It was purchased before I got there. Once I got there, I wanted everything to be ASI because I needed everything to communicate. So that's why your system with the LIS is, is awesome because you need it to communicate. It's all about communication. So right now I have three platforms in my lab that do not speak to each other. I have a Metasystems, an ASI, and a BioView. The only thing that I really love is the ASI, <laughs> all right? We bought the BioView uh, to run Eurovision. It's not working out too well. It breaks slides. Is anybody here from BioView? Okay, good. It breaks slides. All right, back to it. So CML can be detected by fish using a dual color fusion probe set for BCR able to detect a translocation. Awesome, right? It's not that boring. So the three Ds, what are the three Ds? <laughs> documentation, documentation, documentation. Look, it makes no sense to go through all of this and not document it. So these are the things that I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna be super detailed. Uh, you can see my slides are very simple because I like to talk. I'm gonna talk to you. I wanna give you real life and real world scenarios. It does not matter, and I wish Dr. Nordberg was here. She's not here. Okay, not yet, no problem. 
She actually in, inspected our lab uh, for her, her team at Delta Pathology is a great lab. Uh, her team inspected our lab. Now, when you go through an inspection, that's why I said, if you grab a CAP inspection or a New York State inspection, especially New York State, because they're sticklers. If CAP comes through, I'm never nervous. I'm smiling. When New York State comes through, I'm a little nervous. Not because we've done anything wrong, but they go through in finite detail everything. And you must have it documented or else it's a deficiency. CAP folks are usually a little friendlier. They'll say, you know, fix this on site, no problem. Uh, but the thing is, is that it makes no sense to set up a test and set up a whole lab and have zero documentation. I know of a major lab right now here in Houston, Texas that shut down because they had zero documentation when CAP came through. I've never heard of a lab that, to have 50 deficiencies uh, on an inspection, but that's what happened because they had zero documentation. Now, how did that happen? <laughs> You're shocked, right? <laughs> so was I. So when I, when I first heard it, I'm like, how did that happen? Well, they said they had MAs set up the lab. Oh, yeah. Now there's no knock on MAs, but they're not cytogeneticists. They're not, they're not, so back in the day, they used to be at the end of our names, CLS, SPCG. What does that stand for, for all the old school people? Thank you, thank you. Clinical Laboratory Specialist in Cytogenetics. So, it takes a specialist to set up a lab. That's what you guys all are. They might have changed the acronym at the end, but you know, you're still laboratory specialists. So when you have someone setting up a lab that truly does not know what they're doing, and it's no knock on them, they just were not classically trained. So not practicing the three Ds will lead to delays, deficiency, and disaster. And that's what you don't want, yes. Medical assistance. And that's why I said there's absolutely nothing wrong with it, but you know, I'm not gonna ask my dentist to perform my neurosurgery. You know, it's, it's, it's not a knock on them at all. It's just that we're classically trained in a certain type of science, and, okay. and that's where we, thank you very much. I appreciate that. So, uh, that's another thing. I welcome questions. I love questions because, you know, my mentor. So, I have no problem with you interrupting me, asking me questions, okay? Make sure they're softball so I can. <laughs> <laughs> so again, 50 deficiencies at this particular lab and now they, what they, they can't do anything. And that's not the only lab. I know another lab out in Southeast Texas is the same thing. State of the art lab is completely shut down. They're talking about selling off their equipment because they had CAP come in. And once CAP comes in and sees that many deficiencies, usually CLIA is gonna come in. And if CLIA comes in, whoo. <laughs> Start getting your resumes together. No, if, if typically if you have a clear inspection, you're either a brand new lab or something has gone wrong. So in my almost 20 years, I've never gone through a clear inspection um, because usually my labs are pristine. Uh, I'm one of the few, uh, now it it's, should be impossible, but I went through four cap inspections in a row with zero deficiencies in our lab. That's impossible. Um, but it's because documentation. CAP and New York State is an open book test. All you have to do is read the notes and, and prepare. We're not hiding anything. Everything is laid bare for you to see. Uh, Kanye, there he goes, tr trying to ruin another presentation. <laughs> Getting to know you. What are the pro parameters? Uh, what is expected? What are the expected normal and abnormal patterns? These are all things that we need to know before we even start the validation process. Notice how many things we're talking about before we even get to the validation process. We have not technically started the validation process, but you've got to know all of these things. Uh, is it supposed to be too red, too green? What are, we, what are we doing right here? What is the established scoring criteria? And we need to establish a database to calculate our cutoff values. So. What are the parameters? What am I supposed to see? Is it too red, too green? Because it's a dual fusion probe, is that the normal uh, pattern that we're supposed to see? Is it too fusion because it's a dual break, is because it's a break apart probe? Or is it just too red because it's an enumeration probe? All those are things that you need to know prior to starting uh, this particular test. Localization, which way did it go? 
So looking here, can you tell what this test is? We have, we have no clue what this is. And usually in hematopathology, you're going to be dealing with interfaces, not metaphases. Okay? So that's why a localization study is uh, so vital and so important. So in our SOP, we define uh, localization that it ensures that each probe hybridizes to the appropriate target chromosome and no other chromosome. So if we pull this up, now that we have a metaphase, can you tell me what fish it is? Yeah, I, yes, I expected you guys to say that. Why? Because there's obviously a C group nine and a G group 22. You're wrong. It's not a BCR able. What chromosome is that? And that is a, you see how easy it is to make that mistake? And that wasn't to set you guys up. That's to let you know how easy it is to make that mistake. This is why it is imperative that you do your localization. So you think it's not an important step in the validation process, but it's vital. So what happens if you grab the wrong vial? And I worked at a lab to where they used to take all of the probe out of the, out of the original tube and put them in the vial in a snap tube. Now, I, I stopped that process. <laughs> but they would then transcribe on top of it what it was supposed to be. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Because I don't know the expiration, I don't know who opened this thing, and I don't know if you cross-contaminated this. You might have cross-contaminated, we'll get to that later. But as you can see, if you grab something, and now I go back to my CML patient, and I grab this tube, and I think here it is that I'm running BCR able 922, what is the result going to be on this patient? If I never did my localization, if I skipped a step, it's going to be normal all day and all night, right? But I'm using the incorrect probe. So that's why your localization is so important. So again, why I love ASI, and I, I don't mean to bad mouth uh, any other vendor, uh, but there's a difference between Metasystems and ASI. On Metasystems, it won't let me do this. Or at least when I first got there in 2012. Now, in 2012, they still could not reverse DAPI. Well, really? So when, when they came in, I said, you guys can't do this? Well, there's a series of steps that we can do for ASI. David, how easy is it? You click a button. <laughs> and it reverses the DAPI, and I get to do my localization. Now, I've got to do a, a hundred of these. So again. When we're talking about, oh, okay, let's, let's now play the age game. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm much older than you. You look like 20. I don't know. I don't think you can, we can't get a drink after work. Um, <laughs> she looks about 20. I'm trying to tell you that fix is amazing. Um, I'm really thirsty. <laughs> I've got her beat. I'm 42. See? So I came into a lab when they were still mouth pipetting. Ooh. <laughs> we used to take photos in a dark room and cut them out. So when I first arrived at Dynagene, I was still cutting out uh, chromosomes. Man, I'm driving the cameraman crazy, am I not? I'm moving, sorry, I'm just, I'm just thinking about that. Man, I'm moving so much. But we used to literally cut them out and then paste them on a paper. And I'm just like, oh my God. So I thought I was gonna be fired within the first two weeks because I'm like, I am not getting this at all. Uh, but automation has brought us out of the dark ages into the light. Uh, before, imagine having to take a picture, and again, 2012, this is prior to ASI coming to this lab, we were taking pictures with a pathology camera, then having to upload it in Irfan view, and then manipulating it in that. Talk about adding time and talk about pulling out hair, okay? I was bald headed when I first got to uh, apply diagnosis. Uh, it grew back like Samson. Yes? We used to take pictures of fish uh -huh. that have to go to the local drugstore, <laughs> wait for it to be developed, and then come back the next day. Or, no, See, I heard that. Speedy development was the next day. Right, right. <laughs> Some of it all. Yeah, just a little. Just a little. That fix is amazing. So, 
back to it again this is the localization um, the localization study and so when we do localizations we want to take a minimum of five metaphases uh, and then invert the image now we say a minimum so who's ever heard of best practice that's what we stop cheating but that's that's really what we we do there's always a minimum to everything okay now when you get out into the workforce are you going to want me to pay you the minimum salary? <laughs> exactly. You're going to want a little bit more. So for our patients' benefits, we have to go the extra mile. We don't want to just do the bare minimum. This is somebody, and never lose sight of this. Even though I worked at a uh, mega lab, I never lost sight that it was a patient that I was dealing with. It was somebody's mother, brother, sister, father. It's somebody. Okay, they're not numbers, and that's why I love the story about Rosie. I'll never forget that story. That's what happens. It impacts us. We've been affected, um, whether it be a, a wife, a mother-in-law, in, in my case, um, who, who has had cancer. Um, those things affect you, so you never lose sight that, it's a, that it is a person. So we never want to cut corners. We always want to do best practice. So I say a minimum of five, but in our lab, we did 100. So imagine trying to do 100 and then going to uh, fast developing uh, back in the day. <laughs> Probes are so sensitive. So sensitivity and specificity. So sensitivity is defined as the percentage of metaphases with the expected signal pattern at the correct chromosomal location. Basically, sensitivity defines the false negative rate. Uh, there's the math up there, so sensitivity equals true positives divided by true negative, true positives plus false negatives. So again, we want to look at a total of 100 metaphases from five cases. So what we do is we typically make a cocktail of five known normal males uh, and, and put that in our cocktail, and that's how uh, we look at it. Now, when I say five known normal, it's normal by cytogenetics and typically another test. That other test is usually flow. So it's typically known normals by flow and by cytogenetics, and that's how we create our, our simple uh, database for testings. So five, so five cases are scored, and the signal pattern for each metaphase is recorded at a minimum of 95% concordance. So when I do my sensitivity, I want to make sure that every single time, uh, if I'm using a dual fusion, that out of those 100 metaphases, it's hybridizing at the correct place. So I can combine it with my localization. That's why localization, sensitivity, and specificity uh, are usually all together. Uh, can we be more specific? Go. So is it possible for a probe to be specific, or like 100% specific, localized, and sensitive? Say for like an enumeration probe? Yes, it's possible. It's possible. Uh, I've, I've had it uh, to where, I mean, you could even have an enumeration probe centimeter 12, you could have 99 where it's two red all day, then maybe on that last one it's, it's a one, one red. But now are you in 95% uh, out of that 100? Yes, you are. But now if you're only doing 20 and you come across two that's one red, well then obviously you have to keep on going until you get 95% concordance. Everybody heard that question from him? Okay, perfect, great question. Also, when it comes to, oh, actually, that's the next one. Oh. So sensitivity, so specificity is the percentage of signals that hybridize to the correct locus and no other location. Uh, specificity defines the false positive rate. So again, specificity is the true negatives divided by the number of true negatives plus false positives. Usually, this should add up to one <laughs> because whatever this number is plus whatever that number is you sh hopefully you might not have any false positives but you might so again notice the last part and no other location so typically when you open up a vial and you're you have chromosome 12 you're not expecting it to cross hive onto chromosome 9 also and 99 percent of the time it does not happen this impossible it'll never happen right Wrong. I had a, we had a fish vendor who came out with a telomere probe, and I, I can't remember if one and 19 are together on the telomeres, yeah. right? But then 
were you there also when we discovered that from that one vendor? Um, so it was kicking back, I think it was cross-hybing onto the eight also. So you had telomeres to where it was on the one, on the 19, but then we kept on having a third signal. Now, if you're just looking at interphase, you're saying, uh, you know, we have a possible trisomy. If you're looking at metaphase, you're like, hmm, that's interesting. We have a telomere on this specific, you know. Now, this vendor didn't even know and didn't even realize that they had a cross hybridization problem on a whole entire lot. So we actually caught it because we're LabCorp and we're one of the biggest uh, purchasers of that specific probe. So we bought a whole lot and then we had to ship it back and get obviously a credit. But it does happen. Again, I just want to show you the importance, real life scenario of where it did happen. So if we're cutting corners and if we're not doing best practice and if we're not making sure that we're, we're doing it at a 100% uh, or 95% concordance, usually most labs will say that the acceptability, I say equal or greater than 95%. But some labs will say 98%. It's where they uh, typically would like it. But again, this all goes hand in hand with each other. So you can do your localization, your sensitivity, and your specificity. At our lab, we define sensitivity as the percentage of scorable metaphases with an appropriate number of detectable distinct signals at the correct chromosomal location. And we say specificity is the percentage of signals that hybridize to the correct locus and no other location, okay? So again, you can do all of this together. So localization, sensitivity, and specificity can all go together. It's almost over, stay strong. So now it's time to actually start doing our validations. <laughs> so what do we want to do? We want to establish our cutoffs. Uh, we, we need to select uh, 20 to 40 known normal patients. And before I, I told you before, known normal means that I'm checking it by flow and by cytogenetics, that they do not carry the disease state that I'm actually testing. So if I come across someone who is a known positive, we'll save that for later. But for right now, we're doing known negatives. What is our scoring criteria? We did that at the very beginning. Uh, so, I know some labs are switching to only reading 100 cells on, on heme cases, uh, but we still do 200 uh, cells for a complete case. Now, if you're doing FF, FFPE, formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue, then obviously your scoring criteria might be a little lower. And in that case, we're validating on 50. You guys do the 50? Yeah. So 200 cells per patient is split between two readers. What does that mean? So quick math, if we're doing 20 known normals and 200 cells per 20, that means in order to validate just one probe, you're doing 4,000 cells. <laughs> so then we want to record every signal pattern that we observe. We want to set the normal cutoff range and then we calculate it using the beta inverse method. Now, this is a neat little formula that is found uh, in your uh, Excel spreadsheets. So based again, remember I told you that everything that we're doing, notice the number, minimum 95% concordance, specificity greater or equal to 95%. So, based on my 95% concordance, recording my uh, false positives, and keeping in consideration that it's based on 200 cells, that's how we come up with the beta inverse uh, formula to set the proper cutoff values. So this is an actual spreadsheet that I use it at our lab uh, here in Houston, Texas. So for those who actually come through, now her timing is impeccable right now, but uh, when Dr. Norberg came through with her team, and uh, I know she remembers this nice little chart that we provided for her and her team. So typically when the CAP inspector, New York State inspection comes in, they want to make sure that you have done your validation properly. This isn't a game of gotcha. They're, they're fellow colleagues and there is a professional uh, courtesy. However, 
it is their job as cap inspectors and it's serious, they have to make sure that we are doing what we're doing. Just like we showed on that slide many slides ago where it could possibly, you could possibly set up the wrong probe. You guys thought it was 922 and there it was, it was 821. We have to make sure that the labs are validated and using the proper cutoff values because you can, you can have your values too high, the cutoff too high, and then people are positive uh, below your cutoff range because it's too high. So our cutoff ranges are typically set by validations but also by literature. Okay, because a lot of times, uh, most laboratories, they will set up their initial validation products on known negatives, and they do do the known positives, but typically it's a little later, especially if it's a brand new lab and they have limited specimens. So again, this is what we typically give our cap inspectors. Uh, the part that's kind of cut off over here is we'll list all 20 of, of the samples. We don't put patient name. We'll put like P1, P2, all through 10, all through 20 on there. You want to know the type of uh, preparation. Was this a bone marrow direct harvest? Was it a FFPE study? So that also needs to go on your page. Then again, every single pattern that you observe needs to be up there. So this one is for TP53 and we have our cutoff values. Uh, I believe that's eight. Hold on. Put on my Clark Hints. That's 8% um, is, is our cutoff value. But then, as you can also see, we do have different cutoff values for trisomy, monosomy, uh, different, different patterns that we are going to see throughout the study. Because if you're reading, the primary goal or the primary function of this test is to actually find uh, the deletion of P53. But as you're reading, if you're seeing a lot of monosomy, then at a certain point it becomes reportable and you're gonna to have to report your monosomy. Who knows what TP53 is? Thank you. There you go, there you go. It's a tumor suppressor gene, there you go. So, typically, I'm kind of flying, I expected more questions, right? So typically what happens is, is that after we're done with all of this, I, I told my wife I was gonna do this a couple times because I love that transition. Um, she thinks I'm so corny. So basically what happens is, is that in some labs, we would have the cutoff and the cutoff values. We create these cheat sheets and create these binders that when we're reading the fish, we'd have to bring into the room with us. Um, and it's just a waste of time. So what we did, at our particular lab. I'm not sure how many other labs do this. Uh, Jamie, don't steal my stuff if you haven't done it. Um, <laughs> but typically what we do is, on, this is a multiple myeloma uh, count sheet. And we don't have to put, remember I just said, I, I told my wife I was gonna do this like three or four times. We don't have to carry this big old binder and this big old sheet in there when we're actually reading the probe. So I'm not sure if, Similar. perfect. Um, so on here for the multiple myeloma, we have the probe that we're reading. And also, remember, this is our normal pattern. So you can see that it's color-coded. So on this side, this is the normal side in white. In blue, we have our typical abnormal pattern that we expect to see when we're reading these particular ones, okay? So what does the red and green actually mean? So we actually put that on there plus our cutoff value, okay? So for 1Q, Typically what, what we're looking for, or typically what we'll see is, we'll see a deletion of 1Q and polysomy of 1P. But we also expect to possibly see polysomy. We're definitely looking for trisomy or polysomy of three, five, nine, deletion obviously of 13, potentially a IGH rearrangement, and we're definitely looking for that tumor suppressor to make sure it's still intact. I always tell people, and Dr. Norberg can correct me if I'm wrong, um, typically what happens is, is that, I always say if you have cancer, it's like a baseball size hole in a dam, all right, and you've got these cells just replicating. That tumor suppressor is gone, it's like having a 747 type hole in a dam, it's not good. So we definitely wanna make sure um, we definitely want to make sure that this is intact 
And obviously, if the IGH is rearranged, we do do a MM, a multiple myeloma reflex uh, panel on that. So the only thing that I did not put up there was your summation. So typically what happens is, is that when, when CAP also comes through or when you're done with any project, as I told you before, validation is almost like you're running a mini project. When you're done with your actual project, you do have to have a summary report. So that is why you have the case description. You want to tell them what, was, what your database was, what the criteria was, your localization, your specificity and sensitivity studies. Uh, everything that went into that, you want to uh, summarize into a, a neat little uh, document that explains the test, explains the scoring criteria, what you tested it on. So remember, that was part of the documentation. Uh, documentation, documentation, documentation. Uh, Dr. Norberg, I told him how there's a lab here in Houston that had 50 deficiencies on CAP and was actually closed because no one documented anything. And, and they asked, how is that possible? I said, well, the lab was set up by MAs. Nothing wrong with MAs, but they're not the right people to set up a clinical lab, especially for cytogenetics fish. I have some questions, but I'll wait Okay. Go ahead. I told him I, I like interruptions. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Harry Norbert. I'm late. I'm talking after lunch. So yes. So y'all want to leave and not come back? It's okay. Oh, no. We're, we're, we're going to be here. Great planes and automobiles. <laughs> sure. Houston traffic. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so, Orlando has a great lab. We were fortunate enough. I was a team lead uh, a year ago. I'll pay her we later. I expected to find diagnostics with my group, my supervisor, my molecular tech, and a histotech. So um, I will say we just got inspected. Mayo inspected us. Mm. So they dinged us. Uh, okay. They're so tough. I've been inside genetics and molecular for a long time. First time in my life. So maybe because I'm old now, maybe because you just kind of let stuff go by. You know, mm -hmm. we got deficiencies ever. The first time ever. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it has to do with exactly what he's talking about. So documentation is one. The other thing is cutoffs, and now Mayo is Mayo. Mm -hmm. We have like 58 technologists in the room. You know, I have two, okay? <laughs> <laughs> two, and I'm one of them in there. So uh, a lot of it has to do with paying attention to this. And if you do it, he's right. If you do it as you go along, it is so much easier than having to go back and say, "Oh my gosh, what do we do?" Right. So, but everything he said, and the cutoffs was one that they cite, because we don't put our cutoffs in our report. Some people do, some mm -hmm. people don't. So cutoffs are a big deal. Although I will just say, to add to his point, I do have a little issue with cutoffs, because if it doesn't meet the clinical criteria, there you go. like it's 6.5%. But right. if there's 100% plasma cells, right. really? I mean, is that really, there's a little disconnect. Right. You kind of have to use common sense. But right. But he's absolutely correct, and the documentation is key. And everybody who gets in there needs to be on the same page. And, and I know you all, everybody, everybody knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Everybody. Mm-hmm. But you got to show them you know what you're doing. Absolutely. It doesn't matter if you're the smartest person in the lab. If you can't show them how smart you are, then you didn't do it. You might as well just go home. There you go. LabCorp taught me as a yeah. very young supervisor, if you didn't document it, it never happened. That, that's the bottom line. Go ahead. I was going to say, that's how we operate. If you didn't document it, didn't happen. Didn't happen. So speaking of cutoff values and looking at the person as a whole, this relates back to your patient. Right. You can have a positive person below your fish cutoff value, right. but it may be shown in a stimulated culture for your cytogenetics or seen in your cytogenetics, which does happen. Yes. And so you have to look at the context of the diagnosis, your other testing, and what is going on. So yes, you have a cutoff value, but you also have to use the context of, of the whole person, the, their book, their story. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so, that, see, that's why I like interactive. See, come on now. So that is something also that, so what Jamie just said is, on a cytogenetic case, if we're actually um, looking, the, the fish is normal, but if we find it in the cyto, well, instantly the whole case is now abnormal because you find concordance in, you, in both. Or you go back and you look at your fish, right. and they did find an abnormal signal pattern, but it was reported as normal because right. it was below you exactly. know, the cutoff value. Exactly. Or, so, you know, it's, it's in another test type. Right, right. You know, flow molecular or something, something else. So that's why we've got to put the whole 
uh, puzzled together, and, and that is the, the job of a, a MD. They have to, the, a PhDs and MDs, they have to look at the whole case in total and then present a doc diagnosis. This also, as you're saying, is these two labs that you're seeing here, they don't do just part of the testing. Right. That's what the importance that they're seeing is they have the flow. Right. They have the cytogenetics. They have everything there all to be able to view at one time instantaneously. They don't have to wait for that result to come somewhere else. So they don't, like the big lab for us that he, we talked about earlier, you got one test being done here, one test being done here, and y'all both just send your test to the doctor. Well, the doctor now has to interpret it. A lot of times the doctor does not know what they're looking at or doesn't know this little bit here. They see this negative fish, they see this positive side of genetics, but they don't do that correlation and then call that patient positive. That's where this expertise comes in, is you're bringing that because mm -hmm. you're trained for that. Yes. So, the other nice go ahead. thing about working like at CorePath, where you have a platform where you can see your tests, mm -hmm. whether it's applied or somewhere else, is at the tech level, you can see results and correlate. You can troubleshoot mm -hmm. before it gets to the MD. Yeah. So you can go back and see, well, their fish results aren't out yet. Let's get a third or fourth read on that. Let's do our best practice for that patient. That's and it. Sometimes you do <coughs> have to do a third or fourth read to get an accurate diagnosis or an accurate result for your fish. Sometimes you need to do extra cells for your cytogenics or mm -hmm. extra counts or whatever is applicable to that, that patient. But it, it, comes, it comes full circle. Imagine, I always like to tell people whether they're a cohort or a student, imagine if this was you. Exactly. Imagine if it was your bone marrow. I faint at needles, so I'm not gonna get a bone marrow unless I absolutely have to. I hate getting my blood drawn. So I want my blood, my bone marrow, my whatever piece of me to be done to the best and most efficient ability. Right. Can I, I wanna comment, because are y'all, I don't even know, I'm sorry, I'm late. Are y'all students? Everybody students here? Yes. And I want to go back to what Jamie said. So I years ago, y'all probably don't know, y'all know what TDT is? No, no. Anyway, it's a leukemia, an ALL marker. We used to do immunofluorescence. I mean this is like 80s, okay? And we would look down the scope and you'd look. And I had a tech at that time who would give it to my boss who's a hematopathologist. And it, if it didn't work, then he would yell at Anise. He would just yell. I'm like Anise. Why do you give it to Dr. Scioto without looking at it first because you know what's going to happen? So she just mentioned, and that's empowering all of y'all. Mm -hmm. You know, if it looks funny, kind of do the background work and look at it before you submit it. And I know it depends what level you are and what your level of confidence is, but you're the one looking down the scope. You're right. the one doing all this stuff. So you're the one that makes the call. So we had a, this week, we had a constitutional 11Q23 deletion mm -hmm. on a bone marrow, on a guy that had normal cellular bone marrow, no evidence of lymphoma, they ordered BCL1, 2, and 6. So I called one of our pathologists who's complaining to me why the case is taking so long. And I said, well, Dr. Ferris, you know, this really doesn't fit with what you were ordering. And I can tell you right now that BCL 1, 2, and 6 we don't need. Mm -hmm. But you got to investigate it. So right. we're doing some 11Q probes to prove. It is, I'm sure it's constitutional. Right, it's right. Yourself. But you got to kind of think through it. And you just don't push the result through right. without at least having an answer to back you up. It's Absolutely. Like, well, why didn't you do that? Well, I don't know. Nobody told me to. But then that's where... As students, I just say empower yourself because y'all are the ones making the reads and you're the first line, whether it be in the wet lab or whether it be at the scope, you're kind of working through all that. Absolutely. To piggyback off of that, as a student, this may sound weird, but I can read cytogenetics, fish, and microarray. Now, a lot of cytotechs don't read fish. This is a perfect opportunity and example to say, if you have the opportunity, learn both. Absolutely. Learn your chromosomes, learn your fish, learn your microarray. I actually have a molecular background. My bachelor's is in molecular genetics and cell biology. So the molecular part kind of sounds like <laughs> But I love chromosomes. I love fish. And when you're reading chromosomes and you're reading the fish report, I'm one of the few techs that can go back and forth. I can sit, sit at the fish scope, mm -hmm. sit at the cytogenetic scope, and correlate your results. That understanding of where your probes sit and how your probes work, or being able to troubleshoot your staining didn't work or your hive didn't work. Right. Is that really cross-hive? Right. Or is that really a trisome? Really 
really is important at the wet lab stage as well as the interpretation. So empower yourself to learn both technologies if you have that. Absolutely. As a technologist, would you have the opportunity to, to freelance and to go from scope to scope? From fish scope to a conventional cytogenetic scope? If you're qualified, yes. Um, so that's, the th that's one of the things that I notice with students. They love fish because of all the pretty colors. But what do the pretty colors represent? So I, I, I had a student years ago uh, who wanted to come in. They didn't know the chromosomes when they arrived to me. And they wanted to read fish. So I simply said, what does the colors mean? What do the colors mean? So if, if you have this and you're looking at it and it's, a, and it's a fusion, what does that actually mean? And we were talking at that time about a CML. What does it actually mean? What happened to the chromosomes? And if you cannot tell me that, what happened to the chromosomes, then now if you have a signal pattern like one red, one green, one fusion, what is that? If it's a 922 and it's one red, one green, one fusion, what is it? It's a translocation, but shouldn't you have one red, one green, two fusion? Because it's a reciprocal translocation. So you should have two fusion signals, one red, one green. So now, is that just overlap or are you missing the Philadelphia? So those are the things that you have to know your conventional side of genetics in order to bounce back and forth. Because if you're bouncing back and forth, uh, like Jamie does, like I do, you have to know know it. You have to know the why if we get back to David Roark. Go ahead. But if it was ALL, wouldn't you get one red, one green, one fusion? Possibly, yes. That is, yes. So again, though, but, but you have to know what test you're looking at. So again, look at your patient history. Um, is this disease progressing? Is it changing from one thing to, a, to another? What is, that, what is actually happening? And so. Sort of the digital imaging helps though for, yeah. training, for training purposes, I'll tell you. Because you can actually look and have more action. Looking down the scope is hard sometimes, mm -hmm. even fish. Mm -hmm. But the digital stuff is makes it a lot easier because you, you can have people around you and look and versus just you know, yeah. somebody sitting at the scope and they gotta get up and move and someone's gotta sit down. So it is depending on the lab that you wind up in, it is a training opportunity. Right. What what you're looking to with digital imaging as you say is you also have that documentation. You get to see every cell that was scored. Whereas if I'm looking down the scope, right. nobody knows what cell you looked at. Exactly. Looked at. And what you'll see with fish is a lot of times you get these kind of questionable looking signals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is this really a fusion or not? Mm -hmm. I don't want to call this a break apart. Mm -hmm. And you go through and as you go through looking at them, you may convince yourself yes, one way or the other. Well, with digital, you can always go back to those that you question right. and then reevaluate and say, really, what what is this? Because yeah. You will have those times that things aren't the conventional way of this is definitely a break or this definitely isn't. You have to interpret that. Right, and as my mentor taught me, uh, you know, if you're if you're talking about a break apart, again, sometimes it is subjective. How many signal lengths apart is it before you call it a true break apart? So when when I'm looking at the scope. I have to move and someone else has to look at it, but when we're using the ASI scanner, uh, I have all 200, probably even more, because you can set the different thresholds, 300, 400, whatever you want to look at. You can set and look at all of that, and now I can sit there with my team lead, with the doctor, and look at this and say, oh, okay, it's, it is abnormal, it is broken apart. Uh, at our lab too, is our, our medical director is, uh, he'll come upstairs to the fish lab if I'm reading her too, and we have an equivocal case, he'll say, okay, let me look at the cells uh, that, you're, that you're looking at. He'll circle another area of interest and say, okay, he'll look at the scope itself and say, read there. On the, on the scanner now, if we could take a field of view, I know that you guys have the pathology software now that, that we're probably gonna come get um, <laughs> from you that, can you explain that? Because you'll do it better than me. For, okay, so if we're talking pathology and we're talking fish, the, the main problem with pathology is this, is you'll get a slide that has a big piece of tissue on it, right? Now, the, now they're looking down the scope, at least at 4x, just to give a visual, or they'll look down at 10 or 20x to actually do their scoring. So they're looking at very small areas within that tissue. Mm -hmm. So then they'll come with you with this tissue and say, okay, read this for fish. Right. Where do I read it? Well, there's only so small of a circle you can draw with a pen. 
So there's a lot of area that's non-significant. It's right. not tumorous right. that you need to still look through. Right. And then when you're looking through it, are you trained as a pathologist to say what's a tumor cell and what's not? Right. You may have enough experience to be able to see that on a bright field. Once you do fish, that morphology is virtually gone. Yep. So now when you're looking, you look, hey, where do I look? So you'll have a lot of instances in those cases that the, the you will read it. If it doesn't correlate with the IEC, the director's going to come back, the pathologist come back and say, you either need to reread it again, mm -hmm. or I need to come down and look at it. Right. That's all patient wasted time. Right. So what we've done is we give the ability that we can do a pre-scan of the full full IHC or H&E uh, slide. Now we let do Genesis anywhere. Let the pathologist zoom in as, as much as they want, up to 80x, circle very small regions, put this on the scanner, tell the scanner to run and capture me frames out of every area that they circled. That's awesome. From there, now the technologist does the analysis in the appropriate areas, just looking at those frame by frame, checking the scores, telling what cells need to be scored. Then now the pathologist goes back and look. This gives them the ability to select their areas they want of interest. If it doesn't correlate with their IHC, they can go back and see the frames and how they're analyzed. They don't have to come down to the scope. Right. So now they're comfortable in that diagnosis. And, that, and you see why we're going after the software because even though the medical director's humble knee is going to come upstairs, it's still wasting time to come up and down. All right? So, sober. <laughs> <laughs>